भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नारायण नमस्कृत नरम जैवानरोतम देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथो चुदीर So we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, entitled Creation, and we are now in chapter, it's a little bit too loud, chapter 12, Birth of Emperor Parikshit, and we are reading text 34. I'll just say what's written there. 35. Okay, 35. Hmm. Oh, don't. Good. 35. Ahuto Bhagavan Ragya. आहुतो भगवान राज्य याचयिवाचय नृपम याचयिवाचय नृपम उवास कति चिन्मास उवास कति चिन्मास सुरीदाम प्रिय खाम सुरीदाम प्रिय खाम आहुत भगवान राज्य याचायिवाचय नृपम उवास कति चिन्मास सुरीदाम प्रिय खाम Ahuta, being called by Bhagavan, Lord Krishna, the personality of Godhead, Ragya, by the King, Yajayitva, causing to be performed, causing to be performed, Vijay. By the learned Brahmanas, Nripam, on behalf of the king, Uvasa, recited, Katichit, a few, Masan, month, Suridam, for the sake of the relatives, Priyakam Yaya, for the pleasure. Translation and purport by Sri Mangre Sri Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Bravo Pad Ki. Jürgen, vielleicht kannst du dich ein bisschen rübersetzen. Ja. Ja, ja ist immer besser, dass, dass, dass wir setzt euch an von ein Stück. Mehr. Dann kann er auch ein bisschen besser sprechen. Ist gut für die, die die Übersetzung hören. Ist gut für uns. Ja. Und ihr könnt auch ein bisschen vorrutschen, das ist auch kein Problem. If you like, you can move a little bit. <coughs> so. So when everyone is settled, good. So now we read the translation. That was the Sanskrit verse. This is Sanskrit, and now there's a translation to this verse that we know what it's talking about. Lord Shri Krishna, the personality of God, being invited to the sacrifices by Maharaj Yudhishthira, saw to it that they were that they were performed by qualified twice-born Brahmanas. After that, for the pleasure of the relatives, the Lord remained a few months. Purport. 
Lord Shri Krishna was invited by Maharaj Yudhishthir to look into the supervision of the performances of Yajna, and the Lord to abide by the orders of his elderly cousin caused the performance of Yajnas by learned twice-born Brahmanas. Simply taking birth in the family of a Brahmana does not make one qualified to perform Yajnas. One must be twice born by proper training and initiation from the bona fide Acharya. The once born scions of Brahmana families are equal with the once born Shudras, and such Brahma Bandhus or unqualified once born scions must be rejected for any purpose of religious or Vedic function. Lord Sri Krishna was entrusted to look after this arrangement and perfect as he is, he caused the Yagyas to be performed by the bona fide twice born Brahmanas for successful execution. Oma Jnana Timirandasya, Jnana Nirana Salakya, Chakshur Un Militam Jena, Tas Mai Shri Guravina Maha. Mukam Karoti Vachalam, Pangung Langaya Tegirim, Yat Kripata Mahang Vande, Shri Gurun Dinataranam. Shri Chetana Manubistam, Stapitam Jena Butale, Swayam Rupa Kadama Yam Dadati Svabadantikam. Chai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadada, Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Lord Sri Krishna, the personality of God, being invited to the sacrifices by Maharaj Yudhishthir, saw to it that they were performed by qualified twice-born Brahmanas. After that, for the pleasure of the relatives, the Lord remained a few months. So what we hear is a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is uh, the most exalted Vedic text. There are many Vedic scriptures, and it said this one is the most exalted and not just because of a sectarian consciousness because some like this more or even like the appearance of the Lord in form of Krishna more no, because from an objective point of view it's uh, to be seen that this is a higher knowledge a more um, yeah, auspicious knowledge because here the only topic is how to get purified and uh, re realize uh, the spiritual identity, which is a loving servant of the Supreme Lord. And uh, if you compare this motivation and this goal with other motivations, other goals of other Vedic texts or other philosophies or other religions, so we can see that this is the most um, um, selfless and pure, because you cannot get more pure than selfless love, no? to have selfless love. And selfless love is only possible with the Supreme Lord, with Krishna, with a person. Let's say like this, with a person. You cannot have selfless love with uh, your car or with your uh, money. Or even selfless love is um, relative or limited by matter. So it's actually not really possible in the material world. It's something which has to be beyond the material world. And if in beyond the material world there would not be personalities with whom to exchange selfless love, then uh, it wouldn't work either. So selfless love implies there must be transcendental personality. And this is what the Bhagavatam explains, that the highest supreme truth of all the truth, the highest truth, the highest entity is a person, but not a relative person as us, who is sleepy all the time and forgetting things and making mistakes. It's a person which is free from all contamination, free from all faults, free from all limitations and imperfections. It's an absolute person, an entity which is complete in itself, which is defined by itself, which is not, uh, who is not depending on anything. A timeless, absolute being. Yeah. And this is what the um, Vedas explain as being Krishna. Krishna is this supreme entity and it's not like uh, there was once a movie and there you could see this, um, what was his name, anyway, it was like a, was a scientist and then through the scientific experiment he became like a superhero, they call it superhero and he was, he became like a god or something and he was blue, interesting, he was also blue. <laughs> And he was almost all powerful and he can become very big and he had, had also a, a thing here on his forehead. 
Manhattan, I think Manhattan it was called, no? Mr. Manhattan. And, and he was like personified, something being non-human anymore. This is how you envision a godly being or a god. Being completely distant from all human experience and emotions. Being sober, very calm, but very powerful, right? Like beyond, above. But this is not what God is. God is not just in static, neutral consciousness, maybe with a body. That would be quite boring to just be like above everything. You know? the, the scriptures explain Krishna is actually the perfection of experience <clears throat> and the perfection of, the, of a variety of experience. So if it's just a negation of all experience, then it's a very limited being and very limited experience. So what we have in the material world in variety is also feelings, right? We have anger, we have frustration, we have happiness, we have a feeling of loyalty, of, um, of com comradeship, friendship, love, all that, right? It makes life quite rich. We can have a very rich experience. The problem is only that these are dualistic experiences. So we are happy when we are happy, <laughs> when we have a positive experience, and we suffer when it's somehow detrimental to our self-endeavor, our supposed self-endeavor. So Krishna, being the absolute being, has the same, but in a pure way. So he has the richness, he has the variety of experience, but not in a limited way, not in a way that is harmful for him. For us, often feelings are harmful. To be frustrated, right? to be in despair, to be, you know, all that. It's frustrating. But for Krishna, it's not rather, the perfection is not being free of all feelings. The perfection is to have the feelings in a pure, in a divine version, so to say. So rather being just like, you know, distant and non-feeling, you know. This is not the perfection. The perfection is to be, have all the experiences and all the varieties, but in a way that it's always ecstatic. So that's why we say the opposite of statisch, you know, static, static, right? Of course, it's dynamic. But from a spiritual point of view, a Krishna conscious point of view, we can say the opposite of static is ecstatic. Right? Static means like just, you know, being and, you know, that's about it. You know? But ecstatic is meaning there is some experience, there is some feeling, there is some, but something which is pure. Yeah? And this is all comes together in a word, which is our, our goal in Bhakti Yoga. It's called Prema. Prema means love. And the material version of Prema, of love, it's called karma. It's lust. Most of the time in the material world, when the people say, I love something, something, someone, someone, it's not love, it's lust. Yeah? Because this person, mainly a person, is somehow appealing to me, and somehow that's the reason why I say, oh, I love you. I love her. Right? Because somehow appealing to me. If the person would not be appealing to me, I wouldn't love. So I define or I make the condition and as long as you're appealing to me I give you my love so to say and if not then get out of here yeah? so this is lust you do something for me then you know I give you some reward in form of my appreciation my feelings my so-called love if not then not so it's not love it's lust because love is something unconditionally right if I love you real love, whatever you are, whatever you do actually, even whatever you do, this is divine love, whatever you do, I love you. And Srila Prabhupada, our spiritual master, said that the love, the divine love, is, comes closest in the material world, you can see the material, the closest in the motherly love. This is the closest you can get to the real love. Because a mother in ideal loves the child no matter what, under all circumstances. And even the boy grows up and is an uh, adult and, and becomes a criminal and killing people, things like this, right? The mother still loves him. 
Oh, he, he didn't, he was not meaning it like this, you know, don't misunderstand, my boy, or <laughs> something, right? Huh? Often it's like this, huh? So, some I love which is unconditional. I just love you because I love you. Because it's not because you are rich, because you are beautiful, because you're somehow funny or you somehow appeal to me. It's the love which is dominating. Yeah, the, it's the connection. And in the spiritual realm, this is the ideal. And the spiritual love exists, is there because there is a person from whom this love kind of emanates, not just emanates, who a person who is that love. So personified love, so to say. And this is God. And God is like personified love. This is all what he is. And that's the reason why anything exists. Because out of his love, he likes to create. Because he wants to share. He doesn't want to be just alone there. And, exp oh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm love and everything wonderful, something like this. Right? He wants to have... Um, you know, companions and people with whom he can share the love. And so from him expand not just five, six, seven, or eleven, right? Or, or how many? Ten? Ten apostles or something? <laughs> the ten and that's it. Yeah? Unlimited living entities come from him because God has the ability to have a relationship with unlimited living entities. Without being limited, without, you know, oh, wait a little, wait a moment, then I will give you some love, now I have to take care of these guys, and then I will come to you. He has the pow a powerful ability of having perfect relationships with unlimited living entities at the same time. And this is God. And um, that is what the Bhagavatam describes. And that's the reason why it said the Bhagavatam, this text we read a verse from, it's Amala Purana. Amala means pure. It's the purest text. It said there's a tree, a tree of Vedic knowledge. And on this tree there are all these Vedic scriptures, the Puranas and the Upanishads, the Itihasas, the Veda, all that. And from all these trees, it said the Bhagavatam, this text is the ripened, the most ripe fruit of the whole tree. Most ripe fruit. Because it talks only about this bhakti. Bhakti is the expression of prema. Prema is the love, and bhakti means it's connected, it's an aspect of prema, <clears throat> means devotional service. Because uh, love is not just, oh, I love you, like in a relationship, uh, the, the woman comes in the room and the man lies, is lying on the couch and he just says, oh, I love you. And she says, okay, great, but what then? Eh? Love means, oh, I give you some flowers and I cook something, I do something. Right? If I love someone, I express it. I want to do something. I want to please the person. If it's just, oh, I love you and I tell it the whole day to you, okay. Huh? But love means there's some activity exchange. So this is bhakti. Bhakti means the activity which sprouts from the love. It's called devotional service. We translate like devotional service, a spiritual devotional service. So and this is the topic of this book. What is bhakti? How does it work? And how can we um, develop it? Because it said the soul, what we are, has already bhakti. We have already love. The love for God and all that, it's not superimposed on us. It's already existing. It's just covered now as our spiritual identity is right now covered. Or someone of you knows who is, what is your spiritual identity. Someone? So we agree, we don't know. That's true, we don't know. We don't know who we are. We think we are the body. We think, oh, I'm now 24 years old and I'm from this and there and I like this and that and have my name or something, all is written in my passport. This is me. You know, they ask you for ID, passport, okay. Uh-huh, this is you, yeah, here's your picture. You look, you know, it's your age, and it's just all that. So. But this is not me. It's just my body. Or is it that not, right now my tongue is speaking to you? Or my head? My head is speaking to you. Not my head is speaking to you. I am speaking to you. Somewhere from there inside. <laughs> huh? But it's not that the head is speaking. <laughs> right? I'm a person residing within this body. 
So all we all, we are souls in this body. And what we are in essence, the soul, is a loving, living entity. And this love is supposed to be given to Krishna, who exchanges the love. It's a relationship. It's a perfect relationship. And when we understand Krishna and give him love, naturally we love all other living entities too, because we understand they're all part of the gang. They're all part of the family. There wouldn't be any uh, war anymore. If you love God, you are in this perfect relationship and you see all living entities belong to the same family, brothers and sisters. There's one Lord, one Father, and we all come from Him. We are all brothers and sisters. And how you treat your brothers and sisters, very lovingly, respectfully, all that. So all that was happening in the world, all these terrible things and this war and this crime and this craziness, just the expression of atheism. It's an expression of atheism. The atheists say, no, no, it's not true. We can have also moral without atheism. Yeah, try it. It's just a relative version of it. It's just an, you know, a frustrated, uh, frustrated endeavor of making a kingdom of God without God. And we always fail. History proved it. Always when a civilization comes to a point of, of complete materialism, hedonism, anti-spiritualism, and uh, atheistic science, yeah, it's doomed to fail because it's valueless. And when you don't have values, you go into a very materialistic and karmic lifestyle, which is like a boomerang which will hit you. It will come right back and hit you in the face. Yeah. So it's said a civilization which does not take care of those who are really dependent, who should be always protected. And it said there are five categories of living entities. First, the Brahmanas. Brahmanas are like the priests, Brahmana. Hmm? They should be protected because they do the yagya, they do the sacrifice, they do the, the activities which are very auspicious for civilization. Because if a civilization is working towards pleasing the Supreme to engage the whole society, everyone, then Krishna is very satisfied and blesses a whole civilization. So on the top of the civilization should be the priest, the brahmana, who is doing the direct service to the Lord. So they should be protected. Next, the cows should be protected. Because the cows are a very special animal. They stand peacefully on the field, chew the grass, and give you milk. They can transform grass into milk. And milk is a very nutritious, nutritious food. Prabhupada says, a wonder food. The vegans will say, no, <laughs> they go on the you know, barricade, no, no milk, no milk, no other animal drinks the milk of other animals, no, only humans, so you can see how we are, we are wrong. It's just stupid. <laughs> it's not true. The milk, the cow gives more milk than it needs for the calf. It's a God-given animal which gives milk for humans. Yeah? We shouldn't drink too much, of course. Yeah? And we should not treat them like this and, and uh, how to say, exploit them, of course. It should be a loving relationship between cow and humans. So the cow should be protected. So we have the priests should be protected, the cows should be protected, children should, should be protected. Yeah. Our civilization is not protecting children, quite the opposite. Yeah. Once I heard an interview or someone who had an interview and he spoke on his um, relationship with one of the Rockefellers. You know Rockefeller? No? Rockefeller, very rich family from America, somehow connected with Rothschild, right? A very Rothschild, you say. A very rich bank, banking and um, money family. And they are very influential, of course. All right? They have money, they have power, they have influence, and they want to control the world as good as they can and with some good things and some bad things, whatever. So in this person, Aaron Russo was his name, he was an, uh, an director in Hollywood and he got to know this one person from the Rockefeller and they had some friendship and this is how they do, they want to get the rich, they want to have the influence also on their side, these Rockefeller people and all this, you know, in the Council of Foreign <coughs> Relations and all these things, right? So and he made friendship and then he talked more and he told them many things about the world and how they influenced the world. And then at one point he asked this Aaron Russo, 
Um, the, he, he spoke also on 9-11, he spoke on the world situation and the economic crisis and, and the chip, that everyone has a chip and things like this, right? The standard, um, standard, um, well, how is it said? The standard uh, conspiracy theories, so to say, <laughs> confirmed by them. Um, so, and then he asked them, Aaron, what do you think of, of, of women's lip? And this is the short term, women's lip, women's, women's liberation. And Aaron Russo said, of course, a very good thing. In the 60s, the women could also vote and could drive a car and have equal rights and get the same money and all this. And very good. And then this uh, Rockefeller said, Aaron, you're an idiot. <laughs> and that we did it. It was not the woman who did it. We did it. And you know why? Before, it's true, the woman had not so many rights, yes. But she was protected by the family. She was protected by the husband. And when there was a marriage, they paid, only the husband had, pay, had to pay taxes. When we gave them liberation, they had also to pay. So we get a double amount of taxes. And a very important thing, he said, before that, the children were very protected in family because most of the time the woman was not working, could take care of the children. It was a very stable family. With that, the woman was to force, forced, we, we, they told them, yes, you have to also work. You know, you cannot sit at home all day and cook some pancakes for your husband. What's that? Equal rights. You can also work and be successful. Go out in the world, conquer, be like a man. And so they got instigated. Yes, yes. Oh, we don't listen to our husbands anymore. Oh, we also want to work. But that means the children have to very early, how to say, someone has to take care of them. And who will take care of them? The state. Right? And we have the kindergarten, very early, three years old. The children are three years. You give them in, under the, the shelter of the state, who very early can start to indoctrinate the children. Because when they are very young, it's very easy to form them. And the state can put whatever in their minds what they like to. And so they grow a wonderful, you know, uh, how to say, civilization, wonderful society. Yeah? So this is what this Rockefeller guy told this Aaron Russo. No? Very interesting. So that's why the Veda says, children, they have to be protected. And how? To live in a very harmonic and very stable, very loving situation. And all uh, with the endeavor to give them Krishna. Yeah? To, to, uh, to help these souls who are in the small body from the beginning have an harmonic relationship with God and through this with nature and all that and develop wonderful qualities and don't become little rascals and later on big rascals. Nowadays we just sit them in front of the TV, you know, what, turn it on and we do whatever we like and they get like all this crap. And then they wonder why little psychopaths are running around you know, and doing crazy things. We made them, right? We made them. So the priest, the cows, the brahmanas, uh, the children, and the women. Women have to be protected. Women have to be taken care of. Because from the woman comes the child. And if the women are just running around freely, and everyone can take one, I say it drastically, but it's like this. Oh, I take this one, and I enjoy it as long as I like, and then I like, don't like you anymore, go away, and I'll take the next. This was not possible in Vedic society. If the man wants to have a relationship with a woman, then they have to be together and be taken care of. They cannot just, oh, today with you, tomorrow with you, and whatever. Right? This, is a, this is a sign of degradation of the society, of complete materialism, of understanding. I think relationship is just for the body and just for sex. And when sex is boring, which will happen very soon, then we need a new one. But if the relation was built on values, on learning, on taking care, on responsibility, understanding relationship is not just honeymoon. There come also hard times in life and the partners, you have to go through it. They learn much more. They, have to lear they will learn what they have to learn. And not just enjoy for some time and take the next one. They will never learn. So women have to be protected. And in the end, what else? I think there were five, right? The brahmanas, the cows, the children, and the old ones. The old people. Oh, my parents are old now, and I just, you know, put them in the old people's home. And they give them some drugs, and they don't say anything, they lie all day long. 
or something like that. So. The old ones has to have to be protected, and we can con we can um, we can learn so much from yeah. them because they are old and they saw so many things in life. And if they lived a life in a, in, a, in God consciousness, they are very wise. They are not old; they are wise. Our old people now they are you know <laughs> what is it you know Alzheimer yeah they are uh, dement. Well, how is it in English? Yeah, but there's a special word for the yeah. dement or sen senile, huh? Senile. This is how old people are seen. Old people are not cool. Huh? You don't ask your grandfather, oh, okay, let's go to the disco. I will show you all my cool friends. Oh, grandpa, come. No, I show. Hey, friends, I show you the coolest guy on earth. This is my grandpa. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> But in the ideal society, it's like this. The old people are the coolest because they know the most. They are very you know, advanced. And if they use their life also for, sp for spiritual things, they're very pure in heart. So you can see this in the Hare Krishna movement. Um, we have young people, we have old people, but the oldest, the older ones, are the best. These are our gurus. These are our masters. Because they had like 30, 40, 50 years of intense practice of Krishna consciousness. They're very advanced. And we can learn so much from them. So this is what the Veda explains on uh, a society, how it should be run, with which values and how it should work and inter how they should interact. So, uh, and I think this is a complete different picture painted than in comparison to what's happening nowadays, right? Complete different. Right? And uh, Srila Prabhupada envisioned the Hare Krishna movement of being revolutionary. This Hare Krishna movement, movement shall be revolutionary on all fronts. Not just that we say now, don't eat meat, here's prasadam or something. Yeah? This is also revolutionary, yes. Or that we say surrender to God, yes, also. But everything, every aspect of an idol civilization, of a philosophy, of a lifestyle, of a culture, of a behavior, of education, of relationships... Because the Vedic scriptures are explaining an ideal Vedic society. And it's not an ideal, just an ideal, an utopia. It was something existing. And we heard a verse today from an historical event, which happened many thousands of years ago. And this was in such an ideal Vedic society. So it was there. Thousands of years ago, it was there. It's only now that we are so degraded and we lost it. But we can rebuild it again. We can rebuild it. And so the Hare Krishna movement is an uh, endeavor and try to rebuild an ideal Vedic society, which makes people happy. Nowadays, people are not happy. Who is happy? You know, I, I asked so many people on the street. I made so many inqu inquiries, so many, how to say, yeah? research, and asked them, are you happy? And they say, no. Oh, most of the time, I say, not, no, I mean, are you really happy? I say, yes, like, oh, yes, I mean, perfectly happy. No, no, no I'm not. <laughs> In the beginning, everyone says, yes, I'm happy. I said, like, I mean, happy, like, perfectly satisfied, you know, no. And then what you say, oh, that's not possible. <laughs> it's called the sour grape philosophy. Huh? And fox he was going through the forest and this and that, and then he saw some grapes. And they were perfectly ripe, and he could see, oh, they are sweet. Interesting, foxes eat grapes. <laughs> anyway, it's a story. It's an... So he saw the grapes, and uh, oh, I would like to have some grapes. How about they're a little high? And so he jumped, and he tried to snatch them, but it was a little too high. And he tried another one, try, had another try, he couldn't reach. And the third one, and again, it was too far away. And he looked at it and says, Ah, oh, probably the anyway sour. Huh? They are anyway sour. I don't need them. Before he wanted to and couldn't reach. So like the same, perfect happiness? Ah, it doesn't exist. Because just we can not reach it or don't know how, right? Because if we would really know, have it clearly in consciousness, there's something like perfect happiness. We are forced to do something, to endeavor, to get it, to work hard. Yes, oh, this I should get, but it doesn't work, it doesn't exist, so I don't have to do anything. And keep on taking drugs and watching stupid movies or whatever. 
So um, Vedic society, because it's close to the ideal, or let's say like this, it's, it's the, the blueprint of um, God's society. Yeah? This is how Krishna says, if you're in a material world, what is obviously the situation, then you do like this, that you can live in such a weird situation of a soul in the material world. Right? It's an unnatural situation that we as souls living in the material world says, okay, then you do like this and it will work out fine and you will come back to me in the spirit, to the spiritual reality. Yeah. So this is the purpose of the Veda to explain such an ideal situation. What is he doing? I want to keep you going. Not now. Why now? In the middle of a speech to want to do it and this we do in the evening. And Prabhupada sits all day long without garland. And, but thank you very much. I appreciate very much your <laughs> kind, <laughs> kindness if you wanted to express, but not now. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, and this is the purpose of the Veda, and this is especially the purpose of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So if you're interested, uh, read the Srimad Bhagavatam and uh, talk with the devotees and like this. And use your valuable human life for Krishna consciousness. This is one chance we have. And if we don't use it, we are like misers. Meaning we use our valuable life and energy and time just for ourselves. It should be used for some higher goal. Right? So many things they have. You no, know, so many talents. Like there was this Olympia and this and that. And they train like crazy for the gold medal. They use their time, their energy, everything for what? That they all oh, have a gold medal now. <laughs> Wonderful. This is what you did? Great. You're kind of a smart guy, yeah? Uh, so this the people will do if they don't have a high perspective in life. Then of course, yeah, they will gold medals and you know this and that, you know, working so much for something useless, right? You know, making life plan, getting up morning and, and working and collecting the money. And then what they do? Oh, I will fly to Mallorca. And then they sit there in, the, in this uh, Strandkorb and then they drink beer. And yes, this is, you know, the fruit of all my endeavors to sit in Mallorca and drink beer. Or sangria. Yeah, this is what the traditional do. And sing quite stupid songs. <laughs> I think the most stupid songs are played in Mallorca. <laughs> I think they, I don't know, they want to have some, you know, have a title in the world, in the universe. The stupid songs, the place with the most stupid songs, like come to a Guinness Book of Records or something. So we have very valuable human life form, energy, and we use it for like nothing. So there the Vedic, Vedic scripture explains, use it for something which is substantial, which stays, and this is in the end, or explained about prema, pure love of God, which is something what stays, what is natural, what is substantial and true. Right? The other things are not true because they are temporary, they come and go. Right? Like buying a car. So much money for what? In five years, you know, it loses so much in value, isn't it? You buy a you know, Mercedes even, like after two, three years, 30, 40,000 euros less on value. <coughs> so we invest in something valuable, and this is Krishna consciousness. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Shai. Srila Prabhupada Ki. So class is over. If someone has a question, you can come to me now and we can discuss. But for all others, prasadam, whatever. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.